Good morning, welcome to worship on the 16th Sunday after Pentecost at St. John's United Church of Christ in Monroe. A bit of a technical glitch prevented us from recording our last service, so we're coming to you in our old fashioned way as we did a few months ago. We're glad you're with us. A couple of announcements to share with you before we begin our worship. Um, not only are we posting our worship services online as we have been, but uh, beginning today, our Faith Zone will be posting some activities online, so be sure to check the website for a link to their most recent activity and watch over the next few weeks uh, as uh, Gary and Val will be uh, posting more Faith Zone activities. So stay tuned. Other announcements I want to share with you, our Capital Campaign Awareness Meetings will begin next Sunday, the first of six meetings. You should have received a mailing, a letter in the mail uh, with all the dates on that. Be sure to check those. And if you haven't done so already, please uh, RSVP. You need to know who's coming and who will be online and so forth. Uh, you can't attend either in person and or uh, online. So let us know which of those meetings you are planning to participate in. And also please note on October 4th, that will be our next parking lot worship service. Uh, we will be focusing on the Sacrament of Communion that day. It's World Communion Sunday on the 4th of October. And so we will share in the communion in the parking lot. Uh, and we want to make sure to get the word out. Uh, so those folks who haven't been able to worship with us in person uh, may feel a little more comfortable coming in the car and receiving communion that way. We have little prepackaged communion elements that will distribute to each car. So if there's someone that may need a ride or need to be uh, uh, make arrangements to get them here, please let us know and we will uh, get uh, as many uh, rides and, and carpools and whatever we need to do. But we want as many folks to participate as possible as we share the sacrament of communion. Uh, again, October 4th. I believe that's all of our announcements today. Let's begin our worship. Thank you. Good morning. Our call to worship is from Psalm 105, verses 1 through 6. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength, seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. Amen. Please join together with me in our gathering prayer. Let us pray. Generous God, you come to us again and again, no matter how late it is in the day or in our lives, calling to us, gathering us in, you give us your good work to do, daily bread and boundless grace. Increase in us a generous spirit so that we may do your work with joy alongside others whom you also love. Accept our praise and thanksgiving as we worship you. We pray in the name of your merciful Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
our scripture reading today is a gospel reading. It comes from the gospel according to Matthew. We're reading from chapter 20, verses 1 through 16, the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. Hear the good news for today. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. And when he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. And so they went. And when he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those heard, when those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, these last worked only one hour. And you have paid them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Here ends the reading of the good news for today. It may be blessed to our hearing and our understanding and our learning. Amen. Would you please pray with me? Gracious God, your word surprises, challenges, upsets and overturns our way of seeing and thinking. Come and find us today, wherever we are, however we are, and help us now receive your word, blessed by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Parents might recognize this scene, or at least have heard the last line. Two brothers are busy playing one Saturday afternoon Older brother is elementary age, younger brother preschool age. Most of the time they get along well. And on this particular Saturday, they each start out playing in their own rooms. Older brother is reading a couple of books while laying on his bed. Younger brother is doing some puzzles on his floor. Before long, the older brother decides to move into younger brother's room and they begin playing together. And in a blink of an eye, the floor is covered with puzzle pieces and blocks and a thousand Legos, and everyone is happy. Around mid-morning, the two brothers announced that they are hungry and they would like a snack. And the proclamation from the parents is this, you may have a snack as soon as your rooms are cleaned up. Straightforward enough, you'd think. Older brother quickly returns to his room, puts the two books on his bookshelf, throws his cover up over his pillow so that his bed is made, and arrives in the kitchen ready for his snack. And meanwhile, younger brother is still ankle deep in Legos. Not so fast, says the wise, all-knowing parent. I said you would get your snack as soon as your rooms are clean. Your brother's room is not clean. But I clean my room, says big brother. You will get your snack when the rooms are clean. If you work together, you'll be done in no time. And the response is, oh, dad. And you probably know what the next line is. That's not fair. And he stomps off into his room. Poor kid, right? But really, isn't that what we all want? 
what we expect. We want what's fair. We want our fair share. It's an innate feeling that we have within us. Sometimes that's called entitlement. And so we are keen at identifying what's fair and what's unfair, especially in circumstances when it happens to us. But scripture has a habit of warning us against this thought process and behavior. Doesn't that first story sort of sound an awful lot like the parable of the prodigal son? That too is a, a story about an older brother who is incensed that his younger brother who went off and squandered his entire inheritance and only seeks to return home after being ankle deep in a mess is welcomed home with the lavish party given by his father. It's not fair, complains the older brother, the one who stayed home, the one who did all the hard work, being good and responsible, working uh, and being faithful to his father. Where is my reward, he says. That is exactly what many people will hear when they hear this parable of the labor in the vineyards that we just read today. How unjust of that landowner not to give those who labored all day their just reward. How unfair of that landowner to pay each labor equally despite the different amount of hours that they worked. Jesus' parable might not settle too well with us. It is, uh, it gives us a daunting picture that apparently tells us we worship a God who is completely unfair. Barbara Brown Taylor compares this parable to cod liver oil uh, that mothers used to give their children to cure whatever ailed them. Uh, you knew it was good for you, you trusted the one giving it to you, but it certainly doesn't make it any easier to swallow. Let's review our story and see if we can take our medicine. A landowner goes out early one morning and hires some workers for his vineyard. He agrees with those laborers for the customary amount of a day's wage. It's fair, it's enough, and they agree and they go to work. The landowner apparently underestimates the amount of work to be done goes back to the marketplace, sees laborers standing idly by, and so he hires several more crews, one at nine, one at noon, and then again at three o'clock, each time hiring more laborers and agreeing to pay them what is right. No specific amount is mentioned here. We can imagine those workers felt what is right would be a day's wage prorated by the amount of hours that they worked. Oddly enough, then at about five o'clock, when there was just a, about an hour's daylight left to work, the landowner hires more workers and he sends them to the vineyard. And notice here that no payment agreement was even mentioned for this crew. Now at this point, ancient listeners to the parable, and most of us would feel pretty comfortable with this storyline. Here comes the twist. Our first clue should be when Jesus tells of the landowner who orders his manager to pay the laborers hired last first. So as the line forms behind them, then you have the three hours and the five hour and the seven hour workers. And then way back at the end of the line, the exhausted, hungry, sun-baked, back-aching 12 hour laborers. And so the one hour laborers are paid and boy, do they feel good. They've hit the jackpot. They are walking home with a full day's wage for working only one hour. But their excitement is far exceeded by those at the end of the line. You see, they're doing some quick math in their heads and they start figuring out that this landowner is paying a day's wage per hour. They're gonna be rolling in the money. Nearly two weeks worth of pay for one day. Hallelujah. But then a funny thing happens. The three hour workers get paid a day's wage. The five hour workers a day's wage and so on and so on, all the way through the line to those who were hired first thing in the morning and labored all day long are paid a day's wage. Let the grumbling begin. 
They complained to the landowner, those last ones only worked one hour and yet you have paid them equal to us? And you know what line was probably next. That's not fair. And then here comes the punchline to the parable. Friend, I did you no wrong, says the landowner. Did you not agree with me for the usual day's wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give the last the same as the first. Do you begrudge my generosity? You see here, the landowner is making two claims. First, he insists that he did pay a fair and just wage and reminds the laborers that they did mutually agree upon that amount. And second, he claims his right to be as generous as he wishes. Why should his generosity be condemned as an injustice? Jesus' message may be hard to swallow, but his point is clear. The allegory of landowner to God is clear, and grace is at the heart of the matter. When believers search for what is rightfully mine, what's fair, and what's my fair share, they will encounter a God who does not operate on these terms. Instead, we'll encounter a God who offers grace abundantly and generously, not one who keeps accounts of who earns what. And we certainly cannot begrudge God's gracious generosity. The story has so much to say about many of us who may be represented along that payroll line somewhere. And it says so much in that vineyard, the vineyard that can be so many different settings in our world. What does it say to congregations whose lifelong members get grumpy about all those newcomers joining the church? I don't even know everyone's name anymore. They're sitting in my pew. It's time for the younger generation to pull their weight. What does it say to a country where most have forgotten that nearly every one of our own line of heritage can be traced to immigrants, some only a generation or two back, and then now complain about those immigrants taking all our jobs? What does it say about a church whose ancient story tells us that we are a people who are foreigners and outsiders, and a church who worships a savior who welcomed people who were sinners and outcast and oppressed. And that same church then now ties itself in knots and divides itself over who we should include and who should exclude based on race or class or orientation. It is a troubling story that is meant to challenge uh, the people of Jesus' day, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the self-proclaimed gatekeepers of the church and longtime members of the faith. It's meant to challenge people in today's world. It's meant to challenge, well, people like me, ones who have plenty of resources and educational opportunities and access to good jobs and good neighborhoods and good schools. People who Assume that the value of a human is based on salary and position. People who believe success comes when we have earned it and that those who don't have it only need to work a little harder and achieve it, whether it's matters of faith or finance. This story is meant to challenge people who are in places of privilege. And so Jesus is challenging us to think differently. You see, the landowner doesn't devalue the laborers who worked all day. He pays them what he agreed to and what was fair. But he pays the rest the same amount as well. He isn't devaluing, devaluing those hired first, but he is elevating the value of those hired last. And so surely this speaks to us in these days as we open our eyes to the justice issues of those crying to be heard that their lives matter, even when they have been invited to the vineyard the latest. So while we may want what's fair, and we want God to be fair, because if God's fair, I come up a little extra blessed and my spot in the kingdom of heaven is secure. 
will know this. God is not fair. God is compassionate. God is generous. God is amazingly gracious. And God makes sure to line us up so that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Amen. As we prepare ourselves for prayer, let us remember those in our community who need comfort and healing. We pray for the families of Lester Butch Johnson, who has recently passed, and for Bill Chambers for his family. May they be comforted and feel God's hand upon them. We also give thanks to the family of Butch Johnson, who uh, gave this lovely arrangement in honor of him. We pray for Gladys, who is in the hospital. We pray for Sam, who is receiving rehab care in Madison. We pray for Barb and for Haley, who are receiving hospice care. We lift up Lorraine, who is at Monroe Health. Herb, who is recovering from surgery at home. And we give thanks that Joy is no longer receiving cancer treatment. We lift them all up to God's care. pray with me. Lord, we come to you this morning with open hearts and minds and wait upon your word to form us and to mold us as pleasing to you. Lord, we come to you in Jesus' name. Let us, like David, proclaim your beauty and majesty. We thank you, God, for all your good gifts 
It is comforting to know you are in control of each of our lives, the world and the universe. It is comforting that you know what each is going through and that you care. In the midst of this global pandemic, allow us to experience again and again your love and care. Be with those who are sick with the virus and other illnesses. May they regain their strength and all receive good medical care. Free us from fears that prevent nations from working together and individuals from helping their neighbors. Be with all frontline workers, those in economic distress and displaced people the world over, seeking a better, safer, more fruitful life. Protect and be with teachers and students and their families and help them replace anxiety with your peace and hope. Be with us all, Lord, for we are all your vulnerable children who seek rest in you. Mold each of us to be your sanctuary for all who come, remembering that we are your hands and your feet in the world. Thanks be to Jesus Christ who taught us to pray the following prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Before we receive our benediction, just a reminder and a thanksgiving for those who have offered their support through St. John's United Church of Christ through the different avenues uh, that we offer. Uh, a reminder for those watching online, we do have a donor button, a donation button, uh, right there on the church website. You can sign up for automatic transfer giving as well as uh, postal mail. You're offering envelopes to the church. We appreciate your generous support. And now as we depart from this time of worship today, let us continue in our work to live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Let us be in one spirit, striving side by side, seeking to find Christ in our struggles. And let us be surprised by the joy of our faith and the ways that we find God in each new day. Friends, go in peace. Amen. Amen.